micro rhetoric is important, but in the war that is rhetoric, micro rhetoric is like having good aim with a gun. Macro rhetoric is like having brilliant strategy. A great soldier would be an expert at micro rhetoric. A brilliant general would be an expert at macro rhetoric. Macro rhetoric isn't just word choice. It isn't just analogies. It's not these small things, but it's this big overall strategy, the massive techniques that people use to really create very persuasive arguments that work, that really change the way that people look at things. I'm going to give you a few examples, but listen, the, the, the examples of macro rhetoric it would be an infinite number of examples. Here's some basic things to be considering, though. You have something called reframing. Reframing means presenting something it, that is seen in one way, kind of changing the frame of it, making it be perceived in a different way. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say that an organization is struggling a lot. You might say that right now we're struggling a lot, and that makes it feel like we're being kind of pulled down, we're facing all this adversity, we might not succeed. Or you can say that the growing pain that these, this organization is experiencing growing pains. Now, growing pains look like struggle, right? But they're positive. Growing pains means in the future, this organization is going to be bigger, stronger, better. That these pains we're going through right now are just part of the process of improving, part of the process of getting bigger. These are examples of reframing. You might try. You, you might use something called altering the listener states. Here's what that means: when you're looking at something, you might be in a state where you're being very critical and analytical. You might be in a state where you're suspending disbelief, like you're altering a movie. You might be like nearly in a hypnotic and very easily suggestible state. You might be in a very childlike state, which is going to make you a little bit more willing to listen. As an example of putting somebody into a childlike state, salesmen often know that it's good to read a brochure to a customer because when you're reading to a customer that kind of makes them feel like you know when you're a kid somebody reads to you and it's usually somebody who you trust so that creates it's an artificial way to create a sense of trust uh, again altering listener states is very very difficult to do but it is done successfully by some of the greatest rhetoricians in human history. And we're going to be looking at people who are able to do that. It's an, an extremely interesting and a really, an impre a really impressive feat of, of verbal ability. And then you have all kinds of emotional manipulation. I mean, the list of the ways to manipulate people emotionally is essentially endless. You can uh, manipulate people who have a fear of loss. You can build up anxiety. You can create a sense of anxiety followed by a sense of relief. You can create a sense of guilt. I mean, there's so many th ways you can do emotional manipulation. Now, when you're analyzing macro rhetoric, it's not just you're going to be able to point and say, like, hey, look, this is, um, you know, this, this is emotional manipulation. You're going to have to actually describe the steps of it. What's happening? What does he do that leads to what? So it's not just labeling is not enough when you're doing this analysis. You actually have to analyze what is going on. You have to describe piece by piece what's happening. Macro rhetoric is a lot harder than micro rhetoric. It's harder to do. It's harder to see, and it's certainly harder to analyze. But if you can learn how to analyze and understand macro rhetoric, it gives you great ability both in terms of things like the SAT and college essay and just in any part of life that involves rhetoric, which is basically every part of life.